Ed Mayo, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you very much. You're the author of a book on values. Uh, you are the Secretary General of um, Cooperative uh, UK and uh, um, also working a lot in the field of cooperatives at the European level. So we thought that your perspective would bring quite a lot to our debate. We're very, very grateful. Thank you. Uh, can I ask uh, as a first question that we actually ask uh, everyone, what does public value mean to you? Yes, thank you. And I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be uh, kind of on and, and, and contributing to your network. Uh, it's worth also just me starting with what cooperatives are. And I think the, the, the value of the contribution that I bring is not an attempt to persuade everybody that they should be a cooperative, but that there may be innovation and value in what is going on in the cooperative business sector. So just to start with that, um, cooperatives are classically uh, businesses that are focused on uh, member value. And by members, uh, essentially, they are uh, people that are involved directly in the business. So in a cooperative, the ownership rests with people who are participating in the business. Now, that may be staff. So you have employee owned business. Uh, it may be customers. Uh, so you have consumer owned cooperatives. Uh, or, or suppliers, or a mix uh, of those. We're seeing a, you know, a kind of a growth of, of multi-constituency, multi-partner cooperatives. So um, the core of it is around uh, value for, uh, for members. So there are no uh, kind of distant shareholders, if you like, but there is capital invested by uh, those uh, members. And the value that they get out of the business um, is in two folds. Uh, there will be a financial uh, uh, arrangement or investment, but the, the major dividend, the major benefits come through the services that the business uh, offers. Now, that's a very high level uh, introduction. Now, alongside that has been a wider frame of ethics and, and values, which has always been there within the cooperative sector. And in the late 20th century, uh, 1995, they were codified uh, into a set of uh, values and uh, principles. And they take uh, that idea of value within a cooperative wider than just member value, uh, because it makes a, an, an, an open commitment through to a wider frame of reference uh, with concern for the community, uh, and sustainability kind of within that, as well as some specific normative commitments, particularly around uh, education, because cooperatives were self-help businesses, often started by people in need. The focus on education and development has just been a, a classic component of, of cooperatives uh, worldwide. And, and worldwide, there are something like 2.9 million cooperative businesses they are co-owned by around a billion members worldwide. So although the financial numbers are, are smaller than some very large cooperative businesses uh, in kind of almost, you know, every country in the world, um, in insurance or farming or, or retail or, or manufacturing, um, then although the financial numbers for the cooperative sector are small, that sort of participation of people is a very large one and a very uh, significant one. In fact, there are more member owners of cooperatives than there are direct investors in listed companies uh, worldwide. So is it fair to uh, understand that uh, in 1995, when this new charter uh, wa was adopted, this is where members value became actually public value in, in, in a way. Yes, if you add sustainability to what cooperatives are, it actually addresses the needs of the environment, the needs of society, uh, in addition to the needs or the, the expectations of the members. Yes, that's a simple way of telling the story. Um, really what it was was a codification of, of what had gone on before, but 
cooperatives, you know, as with other business, are, are a very flexible and plastic form and they come in different shapes and sizes and, and in different cultural contexts, they operate in, in very different ways. I, I tend to say that if you've seen one co-op, you've seen one co-op. Um, so it's very hard to generalize uh, around that, but that commitment to values uh, as being a core to business uh, is still a very distinctive element. And of course you can understand why in, in the roots, because if you are rooted in self-help and big people doing things for themselves, coming together to do things for themselves, then values are part of the glue that allow people to come uh, together. So it's not just the transactional basis of involvement in a business, but it is a, a, a common alignment with a sense of, of purpose. And I think all of the, the great cooperatives that, that I see uh, around the world, so Desjardins in, uh, in, in Canada, uh, some of the insurance cooperatives in, uh, in, in Japan, uh, Mondragon uh, Worker Cooperatives Network in, uh, in Basque, Spain. These are really characterized by alignment. Everybody is pulling in the same direction because they've got a sense of um, a, a value that is larger than their own self-interest. Now you can call that public value. It hasn't been the terms partic particularly that people have used. They've used cooperative value or values and principles, but in essence it is public yeah. Yeah, yes, we're not trying to create a new chapel in a way. We're trying to understand better. But if it is driven by these actually uh, uh, needs and by such alignment, it's also community-based, isn't it? Yes, um, I think community-based in that many cooperatives are emerge from communities of people that have got the confidence to act together but also that in the work that they do, cooperatives can sustain and nurture community because they find meaning in collective action. Um, so as I say, that's all a little bit abstract, but what's interesting, and I think at the core of the cooperative model is a model to, to look at, particularly in the field of uh, you know, triple bottom line approaches yes. and, and, and sustainable development is how the ownership structure of a cooperative creates the space to make a different set of decisions than may be the case of those whose ownership structure privileges financial return alone. Cooperatives are able to make a degree of trade-offs mm -hmm. um, and it's not necessarily the case that triple bottom lines are, are in opposition that you have to trade off of course there are synergies but the synergies are the easy ones the synergies are the stuff of corporate social responsibility the sustainability agenda gets real and it gets hard where there were genuine trade-offs and in my view Cooperatives tend, to, we could characterize cooperatives as complex purpose organizations. Um, because in, in, in my view, we, we live in a tide of simplicity. Everything is pointing towards things being more simple. And in a business context, that simplicity is fundamentally about return on capital, is fundamentally about shareholder value uh, over, over time. And that simplicity comes with a huge set of advantages because if things are simple, accountability is clear, performance can be measured, can be compared. But of course, it also comes with a set of downsides, which is chasing one thing can mean that you ignore others. Yes. So the, the questioning of shareholder value, the dumbest idea, uh, um, and the moves towards regulation of business, the recognition of other stakeholder interests, uh, uh, evolution of corporate codes of governance, mm -hmm. um, are almost trying to rebalance that push towards simplicity in listed businesses with some necessary complexity to take account of the interests of workers, 
to take account of the interests of communities or others. So the mainstream business sector I see is a push towards simplicity being, you know, tempered by that, you know, regulatory or, or ethical investor, impact investor concern around wider governance for sustainability. In the cooperative sector, actually it starts not with simplicity, but with complexity. And I think that means two things. Firstly, not that every co-op will use its space and its room for manoeuvre to do everything on the sustainability checklist. Mm -hmm. Because if you go to see, if I go to visit, um, uh, I don't know, Glen Wyvis Distillery Co-op in the north of Scotland, uh, yeah. their concern is around the revitalization of a town and a community left behind by the global economy. They're focused on environmental impact because they are using clean energy and, and local crops uh, to produce whiskey. <laughs> um, you could go to a different a social cooperative in uh, Italy or one in South Korea um, where the members are people with um, uh, disabilities who are making shoes uh, for the mass market with a huge amount of celebrity endorsement. And their focus is on the dignity and labor of those people, maybe more so than you know, biodiversity and species loss. So cooperatives won't necessarily be complex and do everything. And, and actually the challenge in my view with cooperatives at the heart of things like governance and high performance is actually try and um, make sure that complexity is not, uh, it doesn't mean a way of obscuring what high performance looks like, that you still need to find clarity on the other side of complexity that can allow you to succeed uh, as a business. So I'm just trying to characterize in some ways what's different about cooperatives was fundamentally it's a different ownership structure. And by having owners invested into a wider purpose, a wider commitment to public value, you have some powerful alignment that is there. But it means that it's a different context to mainstream business. And conversely, what works in one may not work in the other and vice versa. Yes, although um, uh, I, I can absolutely see the, your examples when we talk to the usual traditional businesses, but the purpose-driven corporations, I think, could try to have the same discourse by saying that, yes, they're trying to, or the triple line uh, is also having a, a, a complex multi-layered discourse. But what you're saying is that it is still driven by profit rather than being driven by the true interest of the shareholders. No, I'm, what I'm saying is that if you are owned by investors, outside yeah. investors, those outside investors will fundamentally set the course and the priorities of the enterprise. Yes, and even by if large in, in, investors. By and large in the field of... Um, uh, you know, corporate sustainability, mm. um, actually there's not a lot of talk about ownership. Uh, mm. Everything is about really management and stakeholder engagement yes. with an idea often that that will be more profitable. Yes. But actually the ownership side is not so much talked about. Now, it is within the impact investment field yes, where you can is. see investors coming in and overtly privileging something other than financial uh, kind of return. But um, it's just, I, I think this is a distinction and something to clarify. In terms of purpose, you yes. can have a good purpose. Um, uh, funny enough, the organization that I work for uh, put its purpose uh, on a plaque outside our building that we still occupy a hundred years ago. Now that's in brass in Manchester in the north of England and you can't rub out brass and change it. Fundamentally it is still the same purpose that the organization works to and I think that's the challenge is is purpose part of, is it a marketing exercise, is this about motivating staff and uh, others, is it about like those early Silicon Valley 
you know, companies like creating a cult where people believe and will commit to what is going on. But fundamentally, if times get hard, then the purpose could be rewritten for something completely different. And so again, purpose is a value, but who are the owners? And does that purpose lock in why those owners are here now and in future? So we are talking about the, the core of what accountability is. Yes. Not only that, about marketing and being nice, it's not the cherry on the cake, but it's really being accountable to yourself and to as citizens and uh, as the community. I think that's right. I think accountability, you know, in high performance, Yes. Um, you have high accountability and there is a clear line of, of, of responsibility and in an appropriate uh, kind of way. And the sustainability challenge is an interesting one in that sense, in that sustainability, sustainable development, means a, a reallocation of responsibilities. The tr traditional notions of who is responsible for what do not hold. Um, and therefore we are faced with um, sometimes it must feel like open expectations or demands about what companies will take responsibility for. Um, if they're producing products that are, are not in line with sustainable consumption, sustainable lifestyles in a constrained world, whose responsibility is that? Is that the company's responsibility is it the consumer's responsibility? Hmm. And we know, you know, that blame, putting it onto individual consumers and saying it's your choice is not enough. We're not going to solve those challenges through yeah. individual green consumer choices. So there has to be an engagement between consumers and across consumers and between consumers and companies and then policymakers and other parts of the chain that actually moves things on to a different state, a different footing that can be transformative. And that's the challenge of, of responsibility. So accountability is interesting because in some ways you need a clean set of accountabilities. In cooperatives, what we find is that people have different identities. Mm -hmm. So that the accountability reflects, again, a complexity of those identities. So it may be, for example, um, with, uh, you know, renewable energy uh, uh, cooperatives in Germany that have been an absolute key force in the, uh, the, the rise of renewable energy in, in Germany over the last 15 years. Um, people are... Uh, both users of, 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 of green energy, um, they, they're investors in the generation itself, but they're also people who bring those complexities and contradictions as owners of the business. So in some ways, yes, you have an accountability, but the people you're accountable to are seeing it in different ways. They're seeing it as a citizen and as a, and, and as a consumer. And they may be seeing it as a, a you know, a, a, a narrow customer uh, as well in terms of service and, and, and the like. So it's, it's clean accountability, but it's still complexity of roles uh, kind of within, uh, within that. But it's also profit, isn't it? The profit is not yet forgotten. Well, profit is, um, you know, is, is, a, you know is, is, a, is a license to operate. Yes. Um, you know, there is no point being... Uh, the most sustainable business in the business graveyard. Um, absolutely, you need to be able to generate, uh, you know, surplus to take the uh, the business uh, forward, um, and that is absolutely red. And you know, cooperatives are a distinctive form of business, and they will use that form for competitive advantage. So, if you ha if you're owned by your customers you may find that your customers are more loyal and they're locked in. They may be quicker to give ideas for uh, innovation. Uh, yes, Rabobank, for example, in the Netherlands. Yeah. 
yes. has a fabulous innovation program of that kind. Um, but those are the advantages. But then there are disadvantages. You know, the cooperatives, if you have mass membership, that there are costs that come with governance. So you'll find that cooperatives but tend to behave in slightly different ways. And they will do well in certain niches, but in other niches, actually, it's not the most appropriate or best uh, kind of form of business. But so doing well numbers, commercially yeah. is, is an absolute core part of that. What are the examples? What are the niche where they perform best? Um, well, I think where there are long-term relationships uh, is we've seen that. So in uh, food and uh, farming, uh, for example, there is uh, really an extraordinary success story of uh, farmer-owned uh, cooperative businesses uh, around the world, of often operating at, you know, it's small scale or, or huge scale. At a small scale, you get the, the farmer cooperatives that are behind the fair trademark uh, producer cooperatives, yeah. so cocoa farmers in, in West Africa. And at the large scale, you have businesses like uh, Fonterra in New Zealand, which is one of the largest businesses in the country, and absolutely at the heart of uh, New Zealand's success as an agricultural uh, exporter. So there, I think the long-term relationships of farmers uh, and farmers with the land, uh, a long-term perspective works well with a cooperative uh, business uh, kind of setting as well. In banking, we see some very successful examples of uh, cooperative banks uh, around the world, um, but also challenges. Um, so although cooperative banks emerged from the 2007 and 8 subprime crisis in much more robust health relative to uh, investor-owned banks, and their market share tended to uh, increase, for example, of small and, small and medium-sized enterprise lending in, in Europe. That's a very marked trend. But then once the regulators decide that the way to stop banks crashing is to ask them to have more capital as a cushion against things going wrong, actually that's hard for cooperative banks because they're typically prudent because they're owned by their depositors, so yeah. they don't take risks that investors uh, external might take, um, but they can't access capital in short notice because the ownership is vested uh, in the members. So that has been a real challenge and that's partly the regulatory environment. So it's as if it was a, a natural habitat, you mm. know, where survival is of the fittest. And by fittest, we don't mean you know, the strongest, the most muscular, you know, the, the loudest chief exec. We mean those businesses that fit that habitat the best. And if the habitat changes through regulatory changes or the like, you do see changes as a result. So in Germany, cooperative banks are hugely important in the financing of, uh, of, of, of property and of mortgages. And that's partly a a result of the regulatory framework that exists within Germany and the very prudent sort of peer auditing and uh, that exists for cooperative banks. In the UK, it's much more of a privatized, marketized uh, kind of model. And you have a very large uh, cooperative uh, lender nationwide, but otherwise actually it's private investor banks that dominate a huge range of financial companies that are offering mortgages. So in different cultures, you may have different niches and different results. Yes, that's quite fascinating. As um, uh, an author, a specialist of values, um, uh, I, I wanted to, to take you a little bit more to that word because values is a bit uh, like life. It's uh, it means uh, everything and nothing depending on how you prioritize and implement them. So tell us what, uh, uh, for a cooperative, what, what is your advice usually when you come and see them? What values should they put first and why? 
I think you're absolutely right in the way that you characterize this because values at some, at some sense are fundamental and they are motivational. They're why people do what they do. I think there's another reason for those of us who care about sustainable development to be focusing on values. And, and maybe if we have time, we can come back to that. Um, but actually my focus on values as a result of that, it's quite abstract, what do you do, is really learning from the uh, amazing experience within the cooperative sector to look at the practical tools around how you bring values to life in a business. Uh, and that may be how the board operates, mm -hmm. uh, it may be about how you recruit staff based on values, uh, it may be around uh, values in procurement and how you build values into your uh, procurement chain. It may be around compliance. Almost every part of business life may have a way to build values in. And it's not enough just to put values on a poster or on a wall or no. just hope that they will come about. But it's Actually, about alignment also. You, it's about alignment and you have to be rigorous yes. uh, in terms of uh, you know, using appropriate tools and techniques for doing this. And so that's really been, I think, where the cooperative story has huge resonance. I mean, there's lots of things you shouldn't learn from the cooperative sector. You know, uh, don't get me wrong, we get nowhere by not being honest. But actually the side of values is where there is extraordinary uh, experience and knowledge and learning uh, in the cooperative sector around uh, kind of elements, uh, elements of these. But I still want you to develop that because really values is the new word that is uh, in, my, in my sense overused and, not, and also by us because we're called your public value. But it is, uh, it is lacking a bit of uh, uh, definition and, and body by overusing it. Whereas what I hear from you is actually being authentic. So I think the values chosen by a cooperative or another would be the one aligned with the community, the needs. Um, what concretely would you advise then to choose the values? Because otherwise, everybody puts integrity, honesty, transparency. Uh, so we don't always understand what, uh, what it takes. Yes, I mean, it is, it is the case that most um, listed companies will have a public statement of values. And, yes. and that is a start, but it is only a start. The most common listed value, in fact, is, um, is, is, is honesty. Yeah. And you kind of think, well, surely we can expect people to be honest. Is that really the most that we can do? But in some areas like banking, that was never always perhaps assumed. So it, it has a role. So I think, and, you know, I, I would flag up that I've written a short business book published by Routledge on some of these tools. And I would start with the observation that all organizations are based on values. They may just be the wrong values. Hmm. And values are what in, are important to people. So you can have companies that are based on values of greed, values of patriarchy, uh, values of competition. And each of those may have a re relevance, but they're not necessarily ethical values. Yeah. And many of the sustainability challenges call for ethical responses, uh, which are universal values. So there's an old saying that business doesn't have a culture. Business is a culture. And therefore, the most important place to start is not with a flip chart and, you know, PR consultants and a decision on what values you're going to choose. Mm -hmm or let alone a new chief exec coming in with their own <laughs> ideas about yeah. what values they're going to be, as if they could be magic. It's really to start with um, the under understanding, as, as if you were 
uh, an anthropologist, an understanding of actually what are the values in the culture of the business. And there may be different values at work in different parts of the business. And that may be okay. We don't want our internal audit department to have the same pushy values as our marketing department, uh, for, for example. So there will be different cultures within a business. But what we're looking for is, is a sense of alignment. And that sense of alignment is where values become powerful, as you say, for authenticity, but because values are fundamentally a, a deep rooted psychological source of motivation. And if people see their values reflected in the values of the company, in the workplace or in the service offer or as investors, that can be a very, very powerful force for people uh, taking, uh, taking action. So we're looking to, to be able to develop shared values across a culture. That's a start. And there are tools for mapping values in a corporate setting. Um, uh, Minescence is, is one that offers a, a values inventory, a, a Barrett Foundation, uh, another. And like any tool, they, they are just tools. You know, you, they're a way of mapping and tracking change over time. And, and when you're dealing with quite abstract issues like values and culture, it helps to have some measurements and some numbers, even if with values you need to be careful of putting numbers and metrics too high up your list of, of, of responses. And then the question is, actually, what are the appropriate values for your marketplace, for your business, for your purpose? And this makes a huge difference. And in fact, in my book, I tell the story of a couple of organizations where the values went badly wrong. Um, and we know this and where values go wrong, it creates uh, conflict uh, because people see things from different values perspectives. That's particularly the case in cooperatives. When everybody's going in the same direction, it's like a northbound train. But when people disagree, it's very hard to deal with that cultural challenge of, of, of conflict. So are they the right values? And one example I, 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 I tell is the story of, of Nokia. And the story of Nokia is well known, of course, uh, you know, a, a world leader that lost its way and within a very short period of time found itself, uh, you know, a, 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 a second or third player in the telecoms market. But actually what I look at is the, um, the work and focus that Nokia put into values in the sort of three or five years up to that crisis point. And they had a, a chief executive in who really recognized the challenge of values. I think they had something like, ooh, no, I, I, I shouldn't quote numbers because I, I won't get them right, but thousands of people working in offices right around the world for Nokia, Nokians they call them. And when you have those different cultures, how do you create a global culture that is more shared. So they recognized the need to do it. They did a, an extraordinarily effective participatory approach to doing it. So it wasn't just the board say, you know, a top down approach to values is one of the most common mistakes. The idea that you can pull values like levers from a board yeah. or a chief exec when chief, chief execs change faster than values do in business. So you just got to be careful with, with that leadership model. And they ran kind of world cafes, they chose pictures that they thought represented the values. And it was a very feel good, a very costly process of developing values. Uh, the winners of those photographic competitions were taken to a council meeting where the values were chosen. But they were not the right values for the challenges that Nokia faced. And the challenges that Nokia faced were twofold one of which in fact was honesty that there was an introverted culture 
that looked inside and was not honest about where the company was in relation to competition and technology change. And the second was competition within the business, that there were silos and a silo mentality. That created a culture which in a fast moving uh, technology field was always going to fail. So the values have to be right. And often what you may find is that just as we talked about habitats changing over time, is that actually uh, commonly people will romanticize values that were set by their founder or done before. But if the world moves on and they're the wrong values, they're not going to help you. So being able to be conscious about that, and I call this the values uh, fit. So it's just bringing a rigor to it. And, and then the third part of it really is about integrating values throughout uh, the, uh, the business in an effective way, not, not in something that is turning the organization into a religious cult or, or anything, but every organization will have different ways of doing it. Uh, in the States, uh, Build-A-Bear, one of their main values is, is diversity, uh, except they call it die bear city. And it's just a clever thing that people will know, but there is a commitment from the top. Their record in terms of bringing in uh, African-American and minority workers and reflecting and building an inclusive workplace uh, is a wonderful story and very much in line with the culture uh, of the of, of the business and then as i say building it into uh, recruitment you know and, and very specific things you, you can't ask in an interview tell me about your your values or you know um how, you know do you believe in diversity you, you know that doesn't take you anywhere and again there are a set of tools uh, increasingly used to be able to get that cultural and values fit so it's an extraordinarily exciting agenda really for business i see it as a new frontier and it's it's not owned why right? it's complex i wrote a blog on should we be seeing the formation the emergence of chief values officers and actually we've got one large cooperative that is appointing a chief values officer uh, it's not quite yet public but i'm excited by it um, and one of the questions was, who is the chief values officer? And, you know, some people say it should be the chief exec, but then chief execs are quite busy people. Yeah. But it's, it can't just be the HR leads, because it's not just HR. It can't just be the risk and compliance leads, because although values are a good way of responding to compliance, it's, it's more than that. So it cuts right across the business. And so leadership and governance around values, and we're seeing values reflected in corporate governance codes, a financial reporting council, partly as a result in, of input from myself and, and colleagues from the cooperative sector, now have listed values as something that boards should be tracking and being aware of. There are those tools available uh, to them. That's really fascinating. Really, thank you. I so, wonder if uh, you allow me to say why I think values are important to those of us in the sustainability field. No, but they are, and you're, you're speaking to a converted, obviously. Well, can, uh, I, can I just add my, add, my, add my pennyworth on that just briefly, if I could, then, which is that a lot of the time when we uh, are talking about sustainable development, we're trying to turn this into the language of the business case. We're trying to argue that something is profitable. We're trying to argue that green products, green services can bring consumer benefits, material gains, can be as cost effective. And when we use that language, we are putting a frame on the discussion that triggers a set of responses which are essentially competitive, not cooperative. Mm -hmm. Because you're asking people, if you use the language of economics or commercial business or, 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 or finance, you're asking people to look at things in terms of individual benefits or benefits for some people as opposed to others. 
Now, we can only take forward the sustainability challenge in terms of stakeholders and public and consumers and investors, actually, if we have a shared language that is universal, that takes us out of those differences, out of those silos, out of those competitions, to be able to see the sustainability challenge as a challenge of collective action, as a challenge, in short, of cooperation. So really focusing on values uh, and ethical values is key to be able to move the agenda uh, kind of forward. Yeah, as you said, the new frontier, actually. I think I will keep that as a, uh, a headline for our conversation today. But I want to really thank you for this uh, input. We're coming to, to the end of, uh, of our conversation. My last question is, Again, although you touched on it, but I'm asking everyone, what would be your first advice to any uh, new cooperative or any new business? What would you suggest they do? I mean, often we do, yes. you know, we, we do support new cooperatives coming forward. And uh, typically when people start in business, they obsess by the legal form and the having something that they can kick a structure. And uh, often they, they end up paying lawyers and making mistakes. And actually they need to spend more time really on um, the, 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 the business itself, the how the business is going to involve people, how the business is going to make a difference. And then the you, of it, you, you set the structure really to fit the, the purpose. And I mean, that's, you know, at a startup stage and, and it's more difficult when you've been going for a while and you have a set of structures or you have a set of owners and you're trying to think about how could we do things differently. But I, I always say that you know, my argument is not that every business should be a cooperative, but I argue that every business can benefit by being more cooperative. So mm -hmm. giving a sense of ownership to your staff with employee engagement, a uh, sense of ownership to your customers, uh, having a strong sense of purpose, having a commitment so to a set of values, collaborating with other businesses. And, and one of the seven principles of cooperatives worldwide is cooperation between cooperatives. And again, we're not gonna solve sustainability on our own. We can only do it together. So finding ways to partner and to be good partners is core to that. So to those within the cooperative sector, you know where to come, you know where to get advice. Uh, and we're very proud to serve and work with uh, cooperatives uh, around the world. Um, but to those outside, take a look at co-ops. Um, and try to get beyond the differences to see actually whether there's things that you can learn from what's happening in another business sector. Ed, thank you very much. That was a fascinating conversation and that brought quite a, a new light on uh, our topic, so I'm very grateful to you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.